A few weeks back, I looked at some great arcade fighters, which due to timing were released on systems, not quite up to the task. And back in the late 80s and early 90s, home gamers salivated over arcade imagery and wanted nothing more than their 8-bit home systems to be able to replicate those life-changing arcade experiences. So publishers made sure the screenshots looked up to task and then released games that were utter unplayable hogwash. This week it's time to look at some of the greatest races from the golden arcade age and see how they translated across to systems like the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Amstrad CPC and MSX. Oh yeah. Developed by Tatsumi in 1985, this was a mind-blowing experience, especially if you look at what passed as racing games just a year prior. To add further incredulity, cockpit versions of the cabinet actually had an incredible panoramic triple screen display, so you can imagine how keen Spectrum owners were to experience the long-awaited port at the crack of dawn on Christmas morning 1988. Maybe I'll look at what other presents I've got. Now that's not to say this isn't an impressive port. It is graphically impressive, after all, that's what this series is all about. But what works in the arcade works less well on your grand 12-inch black and white travel television. The main buggy sprite just occupies so much space, and when you combine that with the sedate 5 frame per second trudging, as it blocks the entire road in the sky, it gets very difficult to interpret the path ahead and control the <clears throat> action. Although that explosion effect was pretty impressive for a Spectrum. You can see how expectations move in a short space of time, as upon release, Spectrum magazines gave it a largely favourable review. However, on its budget re-release in 1990, the same magazines gave roughly half the score, with Your Sinclair saying, What's most unforgiving though is the game's deadly slowness, which might just be bearable if not for the speedometer which tells you you were going at 227 miles per hour. Smaller sprites and a quicker pace would have made this game infinitely better. In fact, a lot like the Commodore 64 version developed by Dave Thomas. What's worse is, although the specy version looks for part, publishers Elite Systems just slapped arcade screenshots all over the sleeve. What was the point? If you thought Buggy Boy was mind-blowing, Outrun was in a new league. Get ready. Based on the 1985 Hang On hardware, but with faster clock speeds, more memory, and increased drawing abilities, this is a game which still stands up today. We had beautiful blue skies, a rapid red Ferrari, blistering roadside speeds, multiple choice routes, and an absolute banging soundtrack. What you're witnessing is the MSX version. Imagine playing the arcade version and then coming home to this. You'd be weeping into your cereal for years to come. Like a lot of MSX games, it's actually what's known as a lazy or direct port of the ZX Spectrum version. All they've done is make things slightly more colourful, including the Ferrari. But like most ZX Spectrum ports, it relies on the same Z80 code. But as the MSX has slower access to its screen memory, it almost always results 
in a slightly slower game, which can make all the difference. It's a shame because MSX games programmed from the ground up, making use of hardware sprites, could be pretty impressive. But it's not actually the worst conversion. This is the Amstrad CPC outrun. On the face of it, it looks colourful, it looks like it could be good, but Jesus Christ! That is far from the truth. Computer and video games awarded 20%, saying, if you are really determined to get a copy for your Amstrad, please, please, please ask for a demonstration before you play it. It could save you a lot of heartache. There's no music for starters, which really wipes away the soul of the Outrun experience. It's also dog slow, which takes another huge chunk away. But worst of all is the gameplay. It's half finished. If you're unlucky enough to hit a car, you'll stop dead in the road. Absolutely dead. That is one of the most frustrating features of any game I've ever played. It's not a playable experience at all. Get in the bin. Of course, Sega were going to come back and improve on their earlier hang-on success, and what better than to whack Super on the front, way before Nintendo did it. Well, a couple of months anyway. Now we get four tracks and a turbo feature, plus it looks amazing. We all know about the Mega Drive release, it was pretty darn tasty, so you'd expect that Software Studios, responsible for sailing, Enduro Racer, and Afterburner would be equally as good. It's not looking great, is it? Why do I build things up like this? Why? Why do I do it to myself? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> it looks like something out of the Power Rangers. Even the ZX Spectrum version is instantly more recognisable and playable. Well, if you can get past the stage select screen, at least. Oh god, my ears! Look, maybe I'm being a bit harsh. When cornering, they look more like biker sprites, but again, it's horrendous, jerky, it's a mess. And the colours are a bit grim too. This is not the Super Hang-On that I'm familiar with. The fact that the Commodore 64 box has a Your Sinclair review for the Spectrum version on the back says all you need to know. Just take Super Cycle on the Commodore, released by Epix in 1986. Look at the speed difference, it's absolutely astonishing. You could have released Super Cycle as the official Super Hang-On and everyone would have been happier. Everyone. Rather than hanging on, this one can slip off the edge of a cliff, for all I care. My favourite ever racer, Chase HQ, released by Taito in 1988. This is one hell of a fun game that used to regularly wipe out my parents' 10p stash. There are several reasons to its fun too. The first is just the atmosphere it exudes, from Nancy calling in from Chase headquarters to the little quips from Brody, to the multiple track choices, the fallen rocket launcher, and of course getting to smash perps off the road in a blaze of fiery glory. What a game. So, it always felt astonishing to me how well Ocean did with the ZX Spectrum and Amstrad CPC ports. Somehow, here were two ports which actually managed to capture all the nuances and excitement of the arcade cabinet on 8-bit hardware. The two games are an absolute masterclass in how to do it right, given adequate time and resources. So, you'd expect the Commodore 64 version to be up there as well, especially 
as it's also released by Ocean. Oh my, this is a very different experience. From the loading screen alone, you know something has gone terribly wrong. Look at their eyes. They've seen some horrible things. This game, I imagine. Because as it turns out, apart from the lacklustre SID tune, it feels nothing like the arcade experience. This dashboard looks like it should be in a DeLorean time machine, not a Porsche 928, and those sounds... Imagine if that's what real skidding sounds were like. We'd never need traction control, people would just avoid it entirely. Zap Magazine even remarked that the budget £4 release was overly expensive for mere curiosity. The whole affair is janky, cumbersome, jerky, unplayable. Any fun the original had has well and truly been sponged up by this version. Verdict, fun sponge. Which brings us on to Hard Driving, a game which well and truly lives up to its name, even in the arcade. Atari's 1989 simulator-like experience always struck me as a bit of an odd arcade game, but a worthy one nonetheless. Now, this was always going to be a tricky one to get onto the 8-bit machines. After all, here was a new world filled with 3D polygonal shapes and tracks that looped the loop. The arcade cabinet needed several CPUs to run this feast for the senses, including a Motorola 68010 and various dedicated graphics processors running at 50 MHz. The Spectrum had a single Z80 CPU running at 3.5 MHz, so it was bound to be difficult for programmers Mike Day and Matt Furness. So it's slow, it's choppy, and it's verging on unplayable, but it looks the part, and if you're dedicated, you can get something out of it. Now, with 3D Worlds, clock speed is of paramount importance. We're talking a lot of maths here, and the Commodore 64 wasn't great in that department, having a MOS 6510 processor clocked at just 1 MHz. One. Here's hard driving on the Commodore 64. No. No, no. If it were me, I would just have made a sprite-based game in the hard driving world. I would have made it look as close as possible without the polygons because this is a joke. It's, it's unreasonable. This is more like it. This is actually an NES prototype created by Mark Morris for Tengen but never saw the light of day. And it's a shame because it uses some really clever effects. For example, these loop for loop sections I've actually pre recorded and simply played back when you tackle them. The game also employs a lot of sprites. But then the C64 version also used some sprites, and we still got this. Imagine getting this as a kid. Imagine it. Zap Magazine awarded it an astonishing 20%, saying about as much fun to drive as half a C5, which I think is a little unfair. Half a C5 still sounds like a pretty good time to me. This is not a good time. It's not even close to a good time. And I'm sorry if you ever had to go through it. Ah, Skillshare. It's been a while. Skillshare, the sponsor of this segment, is an online learning community where you can learn how to program, animate, make videos, edit videos, and a whole lot more. Look, here's an excellent course. Video for Instagram. Tell an engaging story in less than a minute by Helis. Something I definitely need given most of my videos amble on for eons. But doing YouTube, having that creative experience, honestly makes my life a hundred times better, and Skillshare can help you find your creative outlet too. 
The first 1,000 subscribers to click the link below will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Which brings this episode to a close. By the 90s, races were getting increasingly three-dimensional, and I think publishers were beginning to realise that these little machines just were not up to the task. That's not to say there weren't more games, but I think we've had enough for today. I certainly have. Until next time, I've been Nostalgia Nerd. Toodaloo.